Hello, everybody. And today I have a very special guest today. You, don't forget, you're on The Advisor with Stacey Chalemi. And we have an amazing guest today. And her name is Carolyn Willman. And she has she's just a thriving entrepreneur. She holds three thriving businesses. And one of them is republishing books. Another one is sweepstakes. And another one is marketing. And she's going to tell you a little about each business. And she's going to tell you how she became such a success. Because after doing this for so long, she has really understood the ins and outs of becoming a real successful entrepreneur. And she's going to explain how she went about it and explain about her businesses and explain how you yourself could take some of her advice and apply it to your own life. So you could become a, either an entrepreneur or a winner or actually start to go into some of these things and start to participate. And she's going to tell you. So I'll leave it up to her to tell you the rest. So Carolyn, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been a pleasure to meet you. And I'm so excited to have you on the show. Tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Well, I, I'm i known as the contest queen. So that's the first business I created. And I created it as a hub of all things contesting because in 2001, I got caught in the dot-com bubble and found myself unemployed. And I read an article in Reader's Digest about a couple that entered sweepstakes as a hobby and how they enhanced their lifestyle. And I thought, what a good idea. I don't have to work. I'll just win stuff. <laughs> it does not work that way. I wish it did. Um, but it can enhance your lifestyle. So you could win prizes that you don't have to pay for like grocery gift cards so now you can save that money or you can win things that might not be in your budget like a brand new fridge or a car or you can win things that money can't buy like trips and experiences to meet celebrities or go to exotic places and um, honestly I think it's the best hobby ever um, thousands of people enter sweepstakes as a hobby every day and companies spend billions of dollars uh, running legitimate promotions so there's enough prizes to go around for everybody and that's uh, what I love teaching people how to do and that kind of uh, stepped into the next couple of businesses so I graduated a uh, business administration with a marketing major and did all you know you, you name the job in the marketing department I had done it mm -hmm. and uh, sweepstakes is one tool in a marketer's tool belt and it should be um, part of a whole entire marketing plan. You know, I tell companies, don't just run a sweepstakes for the sake of running a sweepstakes. Yeah. And I, as the contest queen, I was being approached by companies to uh, help them with their giveaways. And so I started another company called Idea Majesty. And that's my sweepstakes marketing company where I help viral uh, giveaways you know, every once in a while, you'll see me on social and I'll be doing a video uh, promoting some some giveaway or another. <laughs> and that's yeah. when I've been hired um, to do that. And then this oh, this lady here, actually, she's on both sides. This is Helene Hadsel, and she's famous for winning every prize she ever desired, including a fully furnished home. Wow. And I had a podcast in 2008 before it was cool. I wish I wish I had kept it, but life didn't go down that road and I went to visit her in her home in Alvarado Texas and while I was there she said to me nobody's gonna teach maneuvers for wishcraft which is the subtitle of the book um after I'm gone I need you to teach it and I think she asked me because um nobody in her family at that time was was gonna pick up her gauntlet and I had already written some sweepstakes books so I was already um, an author at that point. I was entrepreneurial, which she did not have an entrepreneurial bone in her body. And I was also mm. techie, which she also was not. But you have to give her a little bit of slack because she was in her 80s at the time. Um, <laughs> yeah. So then I said, OK. And then my life just did a this. Like I nearly lost my businesses. I went bankrupt. Um, I got a divorce. Like it just everything just crumbled. And finally, in 2019, I know it took a hot minute. Um, you know, nine years, almost 10 years after she passed away, I thought I better do something with this before she only had one son left. Like she had three children, but two had predeceased her, unfortunately. And her son, Dyke, uh, I said, I better phone Dyke Hatzel and buy the rights to the books because if I don't, and he passes away, I'm not going to fulfill my promise to his mom. 
And mm -hmm. so I did that. And so when I started republishing her works and then I knew, I knew I tried to put it off, but I knew I had to come up with another business, another website to house all the books because they didn't fit either place. I mean, you can yeah. tell by the title of this one in contact with other realms. It's a bit woo woo. That does not fit on a sweepstakes website. It does not fit on a marketing website. So I created uh, Words for Winning as a publishing company. And so I've, did, I've done all her books. I've also been starting them on Audible. Three of them are already on Audible. I've been translating them into different languages. And through incidents now, this is a good lesson for every single one of your listeners. When what we think is a problem uh, presents itself to us, it's always an opportunity. Um, Helene always called them projects. It's not a problem. It's a project. I think she learned that from Jose Silva because she was also Jose Silva's assistant. If any of your uh, listeners are familiar with um, the Silva method. Mm -hmm. And one day I got an email. Now you are an author and will appreciate this. I get an email from Amazon saying the copyright page in this book is wrong. And if you don't fix it, we're pulling it. You have five business days or you have five days. I don't even know if it was business days. So I panicked and you ask them questions and they don't tell you. And they just say, here, go refer to this page. So my mistake was I copied the copyright the way she had written it in the last publication she did as I did the third edition. Mm -hmm. And it, that's not good for today's publishing methods. So I figured it out in time, thankfully. But in the meantime, I was contacting her previous publishers to make sure they didn't hold any copyright just to be safe. You know, yeah. CYA, you learn in marketing, cover your <laughs> butt. <laughs> yeah. um, and I realized that the second publisher of her book was Tag Powell, was Top of the Mountain Publishing. And then I figured out it was owned by Tag Powell. And then I realized that name was familiar. So I started digging through the books I had gotten from her library and found one of his books. I thought, aha, she knew him. And he was also an author. So yeah. I found random addresses and I mailed letters out. I just randomly mailed letters out to all these places. I didn't yes. know what was going to happen. And he called me one day. Now he was at the end of his life. He had had a stroke. He had some COPD and he had published a lot of books and I sent him copies of Helene's books and he was flabbergasted at the changes from when he did books back in the eighties and um, 70s, 80s, and 90s, he was a publisher to now, like it night and day. And then I said, So who's taking care of your legacy? And he said, No one. I said, Well, how about I buy some of your books? And he said, Okay. <laughs> so I ended up driving down to Florida and and bought the rights to 10 of his books and five of his audio series. And um sadly he passed he passed a year ago, but I I got it before he'd left. And he knew that this way his his books would be in good hands. And so I just, I'm so excited. I published this just before um, I went into a sweepstakes, sweepstakes convention. Yes, there are sweepstakes conventions. And, uh, and I published his book. So I don't even have a banner yet because it's only been like two weeks. I'm so excited. So that's his book number 10. I'm halfway to you, Stacy. <laughs> I'm catching up. I'm catching up. <sighs> I'll, That's I'll catch up. You just wait. Because <laughs> I have nine more of his to do. And then I'm doing translations. So um, every time I translate one, I consider it a separate edition because it literally has to have its own ISBN and everything. Yeah. So this will soon have five editions of it because it's already um English and Spanish, and I'm working on German, French, and Italian. It's so exciting. Well, you know what it's like publishing a book. It feels so good. Like you're, I don't want to say birth and a baby because that's harder, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's awesome. I love it. You know, where did you come up with the idea to republish the books? You know, one of the teachers that I follow who's, so two authors changed my life. And everybody probably has a story of an author that has change the trajectory of their life. Helene is obviously one of them for me because she was in sweepstakes 
and I learned from her and now I'm maintaining her legacy. So that's life changing. And only because she asked me to, I don't think I would have done it otherwise. And that's how I started down that path. Yeah. But the other author that changed my life was Robert Ohato. And he wrote a book called Transforming Fate into Destiny. I love those types of uh, inspirational, metaphysical, um, motivational, self I don't want to call them really self-help, but they kind of are books. And one of the things he said is fate is the hand you're dealt and destiny is how you play it. Mm -hmm. So he says that we're all fated with certain things. And I believe that I must have had a soul contract with Helene and Tag because it just it's kind of falling onto me. And I had a knowing when I was registering uh, the license, the business license for my second company. I was standing in line. This is before they went digital. I was yeah. standing in line uh, in the government office. I can't remember even what the government office was, you know, business, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And I had the paperwork all filled out and I'm standing there and I thought, oh, there's one more company. <laughs> I knew, I knew 10 years before I started it, there right. was another company. I knew, I knew it. And Helene in, and her book has a chapter called desire versus knowing and desire is really excited. And I want this and I hope it happens. It's like when you buy a lottery ticket, you're just excited and hopeful, but knowing is calm and down. It's almost like it goes from excitements like up here and knowing is down in like your solar plexus. Yeah. And I just knew there was another business and it took 10 years, but it, sh it showed up. So I kind of feel like it was on my path and I was destined to do it. And I also know that after, because I have all these languages to translate and more audible books and um, I have nine more books. Like I bought, like I said, I bought 10. So this yeah. is one. I have nine more. I think I have enough work to keep me going till 2026. Like I'm not uh -huh. kidding. Um, yeah. But I do know also that there are more authors coming. I just don't know who they are and when, but they right. will present themselves at the right time. So I don't have to worry about, well, what else am I going to do after that? I just kind of yeah. already know that they're just going to show up. Yeah. Wow. I love it. So I think, I love it. yeah, people can take that into their own lives. Like you'll know there's certain things coming, but you also have to take action. Like these books don't just publish themselves. Mm -hmm. right like you you're doing a podcast you're actually doing it like you had the idea and then you had to do all the steps you know right. like figure out what you're doing get yourself a nice mic get a nice backdrop um sign up to different sites so you can find appropriate guests um maybe get an editor de depending on how you're running your podcast the, all the different steps. So you took those actions. You just didn't lie in bed and go, I want a podcast. I want <laughs> you didn't show up. You, you took right. People forget that it's important. But then when you were taking those steps, stuff started to come at you. Yeah. Right. Like whatever you put out, you get back. So then people start contacting you or said, Oh, I, you mentioned I'm, I'm working on a new podcast. Someone says, Oh, I, I, coincidentally coincidentally there's no coincidence i know a fantastic editor i'll put you in touch with them oh this is the mic i bought it was so good i highly recommend you go purchase that right and you're like oh look at all this stuff it's coming it's helping me on this path yeah and i think it was jack canfield that said now i might be wrong so don't come at me if i <laughs> uh, you take one step forward and the uh, when you take one step towards the universe, the universe takes nine steps towards you. Mm -hmm. Yes, it does. It does. So that's so I, it's, and I, so I just kind of fell into this. So I think like Robert said, there's things that are faded. And I think I have a soul contract with Helene and tag and her family. Like, I don't think it's an accident. Some things are not, there are no coincidences as Jose Silva says. Right. No, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. I think everything happens for a reason. 
And I think it's great that you took you, you know, two of the things that you did, you you really enjoyed doing and you actually turned something that you enjoyed into a bit thriving business, which is amazing. And then, you know, you carried on your friend's legacy, you know, and uh, and you turned that into a thriving business, you know, you know, for people who are out there that want to, you know, really elevate to, to the levels of success that you've elevated to, what would be some of the advice you'd like to give others, you know, when looking to go into businesses and, and really they have an idea and they, they really, you know, think that they could, it could be a successful idea, you know, what's your advice to them? Well, I'm, I'm really grounded. And I always want to remind people like this is a publishing business. A lot of people that I work with because of the woo woo books, and a lot of mindset books, they're in a spiritual business they're doing this. It's a business. They forget the business part of it. Like I'm a little bit behind on my expense reports. Accounting is not my favorite thing. I can't really hand it off to an assistant because she won't know. They won't know all the things. So yeah. it's a job I really have to do myself. And it's of course tied to the money of the business. So I really need to do it. So I've got most of it to the accountant and the bookkeeper, but I have to do the expense reports. Oh, I don't like doing the business part of the business, <laughs> Yeah, but I have to do it because I'm a grown up and I put my big girl panties on and sit down and do those, do those things. And I make it a little bit fun. I have two screens. So on one screen, I'll put on, you know, a, a Netflix or a YouTube yeah. video and have something slightly entertaining going on in the background while I'm doing something extremely mundane. And I feel mm -hmm. like, okay, at least I'm learning something or being entertained while I'm right. doing this job I, I don't like. But, and, and it's not all glamour. Like the pro other problem is, you know, I'm doing all these videos and posts and stuff about like the sweepstakes convention that I just went to or the Silva method training that I went to as part of my um, process of becoming a Silva instructor. And it's a lot of fun, but it's a lot of work. And my other business stuff doesn't stop. So I'm still checking emails. I'm still checking in for clients. I'm still, you know, that's, <laughs> so you're still doing all of this and yes. you're doing all of the fun stuff. And then people look on social and think, oh, why is their business so great? But I here have to, you know, answer a hundred emails and create all my graphics. And it's, it's not all glamour. Like there was a, a YouTube, there was a, in 2011, oh my goodness, it's been a long time now. Um, TLC wanted to make a show like Extreme Couponing about sweepstakers, and they called it High Stakes Sweepers. Mm -hmm. But they had to recreate every single contest in the show because you can't, um, you can't manifest luck and prizes like you can couponing. You can yeah. control couponing. You can't control. So I had the producer one day say to me, so what grand prizes do you expect to win in the next two weeks? And I'm like, all of them? I don't <laughs> know. <laughs> Look, I can't make it happen. I yeah. can't make it happen. So behind the scenes, they're like recreating things that we actually did win, like things that actually did happen. And then at one point I was trying to do this thing with an instant prize and it wasn't working. I was so frustrated and we were crammed into my office and I had this big camera over my shoulder. My daughter was on my lap and like, we're all like crammed in and the room's getting super hot. And finally they gave up and they went to film something else. They were interviewing other people. And so I, she says, you have 20 minutes. So I thought I was so frustrated. I sat there and I did it and I hit the instant win while the cameras were in the other room. Like you can't plan stuff. Yeah, no. There's certain things you cannot plan. No, you have to just kind of go with it and just see where it takes you. So, but that's the, that's the whole thing, right? Like you can't plan some of the stuff and there's a lot of behind the scenes things that people don't realize, but yeah. you just have to take action. Like I said, you, and some things like I have failed at so many things too. Like, like I said, when I was going through my, um, I've had this business so I had to re kind of invent myself because I had a business with my ex mm -hmm. and my first books were written under that. But then when we got a divorce, I started contest queen and we just basically, it was actually, it worked out well because he had his own thing and I had my own thing. So we basically just sliced the business and separated it. And I registered mine and he registered his. And that was the end of that. It was, it was actually quite easy. Thank, 
thankfully. Um, and then of course I had to redo all of that, but I had one year where my whole business, I made $6,000 the whole year. Like I thought I was going to lose the business, Yeah, but I kept going. Like, and people think, oh, you're, yeah, now, now it's, I'm in a, who I'm in a good spot and everything's thriving, but boy, if you can equate it to a garden, there was a couple of years there where there was drought and there was like terrible seeds and there was grasshoppers eating all the leaves. And it was like, you know, yeah. and I had, you know, um, you know, the peanuts were weevily and, you know, it, I kept, but you, I kept going and fertilizing yeah. and working it and tilling the soil. And eventually then the, everything started to thrive, but you have to, you have to keep going. But I also knew it was my path. You know, yeah. sometimes you have to just give up on something if it's not working. Right. Yeah. Like it's I had, true. like I said, I had a podcast and I ran from 2008 to 2010 and I wish I had downloaded every episode, but I didn't. Right. Cause I didn't know. Yeah. And you know, now I'm kicking myself cause I lost all that. Right. I have some of it, but not all of it. Right. What are you going to do? I can't cry over it. It's gone. Yeah. It is what it is, you know? Um, and I had to stop it when I was going through the bankruptcy because I couldn't afford, I couldn't afford it. And I was finding it hard to get guests and I was struggling and I didn't want to go on the air. And it was in those days, like I did upload some to YouTube and people complain about the sound quality. And I go, you do understand because they get mad that I wasn't adjusting the mics. And I said, you do realize, but when I recorded it, we each phoned in on a landline mm -hmm. to a computer and there was no adjusting. Yeah. <laughs> it was It was really rudimentary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the best it gets. And I was a terrible interviewer. Oh my God, I was awful. You would think I'd have been better having been a Toastmaster. I'm now been a, I was a Toastmaster for two or three years at that point, but I've been a Toastmaster now for 18 years. So I'm a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And I highly recommend it, by the way, for anybody that struggles with public speaking or interviews or anything. Toastmasters is the best program I've ever done. That's why I've stayed with it for so long. Yeah, I highly I recommend it. Mm -hmm. and it, and it. And it took a big hit during COVID because a lot of clubs were in person. And then when they shifted to Zoom, a lot of people quit. But the, actually speaking on um, digital platforms is a whole different skill set than standing in front of a group of people. But you yeah. still need the certain things don't change. So I right. highly recommend it. But um, oh, my God, did I just lose my train of thought? I did. Well, no, you were saying the difference between speaking, you know, in person and speaking on digital, you know, is, is totally two different things, but you still use some of the same skills, which is true because you do, you do use some of the same skills, you know, it's just that when you're speaking, you know, digitally, you know, the person is still there, but they're, you know, sometimes it can be more intimidated for other individuals when they see the people right in front of them where, you know, you know, for me, I, I always looked at when I do public speaking, they're just my friends. That's why they're here because they're my friends and they want oh, to hear yeah. what I say. And so when I would walk on stage, I had my really no anxiety. You always get a little butterflies right before you walk on oh, stage, yeah. you know, and then once you walk on stage, it kind of like starts to float away. But if you look at those people as your friends and not anything else, then you feel more comfortable and you're just, you're there to share a message that they want to hear. You know, and that's how I always tell people when they get nervous about speaking in front of people. But uh, yeah, it's it's a good skill to have. And so, you know, like I've, I've and I, but I don't talk about those. I even ran a convention once up here in Canada because I was talking, saying off air that um, we're the reason we're talking so late in August is because the first week of August, I was in Las Vegas at the annual National Sweepstakes Convention. Yes. People that like to enter sweepstakes get together once a year and learn from each other and help each other win. And of course, there's always prizes at these events. <laughs> <laughs> and then I came back and unpacked and repacked and went to Connecticut to take the Silva method from a gentleman who was the youngest person ever certified by Jose Silva to be an instructor in 1971. He's been teaching ever since. 
And um, that was phenomenal. And I do prefer those kind of courses in person, even though you can take them on Zoom, because for me, as a as a student, like, and everybody learns different. Some people thrive on the Zoom. I I don't. Right. Um, so I tell people, you you have to take the path that works for you. And I know right. myself well enough to know that I do better in person. So, and I also like the energy of the other students. Yes. I find it helps elevate the uh, learning because we have, you know, we have auras around us and you can feel other people. That's why you walk in a room and say, Ooh, the vibe feels off or, Ooh, it's very exciting in here. Well, that's your energy. You're feeling everybody else's energy. So right. I really prefer that. And so I took it from Ken Casilla and um, that was exciting. So I'm actually taking the mastery class this December. So I'm always, that's the other thing you sh you don't stop. Right. You know, we're here. You don't stop learning till you die. Yes. <laughs> so Never. I'm always, I'm still, I'm still learning. So I'm taking the Silva Mastery class this December. I'm so excited. Back in yeah. Connecticut. <laughs> and so, I know. So you, you, so you, you also, you keep going, but I don't really, so back to the, the failure, the convention, I tried to run one in Canada like 15 years ago and it failed miserably. Like I think I lost 15 grand out of my pocket and I'm so and that was low like it could have been way worse than that right but nobody talks about those failures they only talk about oh look I just published I published this book and this one's a bestseller they don't go oh yeah this tanked this failed this flopped nobody talks about those yeah. And so true. the people go, well, why am I struggling? No, I watch all these other people and they didn't. Oh yeah, they did. They just don't talk about it. Yeah. Well, they even say like Alex Mosey talks about it many times he's had, like I think in the beginning he had like seven failed businesses, you know, until he actually finally, you know, he, he profited off his next business, but he had failure after failure after failure. And you hear many stories like that. And it's true. You do hear about all the positive things, but you don't hear too much about the negative. You will hear some people who have, you know, have made it to the top. They will go back and they will talk about their, you know, their failures, you know, and, uh, but everybody goes through their ups and downs. Everybody goes through, you know, the good and the bad, you know, and, and that's how we learn. We take, you know, the things that, that don't happen exactly yeah. the way we anticipated we use those as learning mechanisms and they give us resilience and we, we use it. So in the future, we make ourselves better, you know, and it works. Yeah. My daughter had that. She's, she's um, in university. She's taking illustration. I'm so proud of her. She's a born artist. And she had, she was participating in her first art show. It was a collaborative art show. So she was only putting in two pieces and she had to you know, get copies of them and frame them and price them and do all the things. And then she realized that she'd priced them too low. Um, and I said, that's okay, because this is how you learn. Like, yes. you didn't fail. You just learned what not to do next time. Right. Right. Like, it, she didn't really lose anything, so to speak. I mean, she wasn't going to lose money, but she wasn't going to make any money either. Right. Mm -hmm. Um. But she learned through the process. And so she was kicking herself. And I'm like, why? That's great. You now know what not to do next time. You now know that you have to take into account this and see how much time that takes and figure that out. And you've done it once. And the next time it's going to be better. Yes. And so I reframed it for her. And when I did that, she felt a lot better. because And I think a lot of people need to give themselves some slack um, when they come across this. Because the, the negative self-talk is terrible oh I'm so stupid why did I do that I can't believe it and and I'm an idiot and only you know a failure would do that no you're yeah. a human being mucking around on a planet that's flying through space <laughs> learning right. as you go and mm -hmm. and you know it's not that big a deal like if if you're not going to remember it in 10 minutes and, right. And in a hundred years, is it really going to matter? Well, some things, yeah. Like I'm hoping that my doing this work will keep this around for a long time. hundred percent. So I'm hoping that, but is anybody going to remember that I published a book a week late? Right. No. Is anybody going to remember that, you know, 
I don't know. I can't think of another example at the moment, but it doesn't matter. Right. Like, if there was you know, a type. Does it, does it matter that I didn't make my bed this morning? No. Right. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Don't, don't sweat about stuff that doesn't matter. And these are things that everybody does. So it's like, you yeah. know, you're not the only one, you know, that's what people have to realize. They're not the only one, you know, a lot of people are, we're, we're too self-critical of ourselves. And I think that's the biggest problem is that we are too hard on ourselves when everybody, you know, we all have the same emotions. We all feel the same way and we all do a lot of the same things, you know, and it's just like, if you get your eyebrows done and, and, you know, before you get your eyebrows done and you, let's say you're going somewhere and you forgot that you're going somewhere and you have some eyebrows growing in, you're like, oh my God, everybody's going to see my eyebrows. Nobody sees your eyebrows. You know what I'm saying? Like, you should say that because mm -hmm. I had them waxed a couple of weeks ago before I went away and she made them too thin. So mm -hmm. I have not been plucking them. Can anybody tell? No. no, only if I went like this and went up to the camera and like, no, thankfully that's the other blessing I have. I wear glasses, so <laughs> it kind of hides it a little, but I don't sweat it. You know, yeah. like I don't have a hairdresser appointment till mid-September. My right. hair's growing out. Does it matter? No, I look fine. Exactly. People were too picky. Yes. You know, like just. It's, too self-conscious. It, yeah, we're too self-conscious. Um, I always say, uh, you know, to go dance. What was the saying? Someone said, go and dance anyway, because everyone's too busy looking at their phones. <laughs> <laughs> like it used to be, I think it used to be everyone's too busy looking at their own belly button, implying that more people are worried about themselves than worried about you. Yeah. But now everybody's looking at their phones. And yeah, I, I've, and I feel like a late bloomer because I'm almost 58. And it feels like it, it's taken me to 50, like the last like eight years before I really got into the groove of not caring what other people think, doing, you know, going to the beat of my own drum and just thriving in my own lane and discovering that everybody likes me in this lane. And I'm like, why didn't I do this sooner? So that's another message. Don't worry about what other people think. Yes. And I think like, that you can do that. It's, but like I said, I feel like I, I feel like I'm where I am now, where I wanted to be at 25. It's taken mm. me like 30 years longer to get to where I wanted to be, but that's okay. I did get here. But you know, like I, it's so funny you said that because most of the successful business people that I have met in my, in my lifetime have, did not reach success until they were in our age bracket. And, you know, a lot of times, like I even remember I, I took this course and I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to be the oldest one in this class, you know? And I go in there and everyone is my age or older. And it's like, so, you know, I, it's, it's you know, and, and when I met mo a lot of successful people and I talked to them, it wasn't until our age group that a lot of them hit the success route. You know, there was like yeah. a small percentage that maybe got their shit together at a really early age, you know, but that was like a, I mean, a very small under yeah. 5%, you know, maybe 3%, you know, but the rest, the rest of us all put, figured everything out between 40 to 60. It was like, or, or you know, about that age group it was when people started really putting the pieces together and then started really hitting the gas pedal. And then things started to really have a snowball effect. But, you know, for most people, you know, it, it, it it's a process of learning, you know, and, and when you do get into your fifties, you do, you, you start really f figuring out who you are, not caring so much what other people think. That's a and, big one. Yeah. And knowing what you want. And then a lot of people having the courage to go after it, you know, and those are the people who succeed, you know, but it's really our age bracket that that starts to happen because it, it's a process. It's definitely a process. Yeah. And also um, this book, and I like the title because Helene reminds us, she calls it the name it and claim it game because this is a game and we need to play. And we need to do it with a lighter attitude. Like right. try something. It mm -hmm. doesn't work. It doesn't matter. Try something else. And have right. like, like I'll give you a funny example. 
I I planted some vegetables in the back garden and I had more plants than space. So I thought I'm just going to put them in the front garden. Doesn't right. matter if there's tomatoes growing with the flowers. <laughs> and I put one beside the front steps because it had a lattice uh, handrail. And I thought, oh, if it gets big, I can tie the tomatoes to it. It's perfect. Yeah. And my boyfriend, George, he goes, I don't think that's a good idea. It doesn't get a lot of sun there. That plant's not going to do very well. I'm like, well, I don't have any other spots. So that's where it's going. <laughs> that's the biggest plant we've got. Oh, really? <laughs> we had to turn it back so much. It's like through the stairs, almost blocking sometimes. We had to cut it back, but we don't want to cut too many of the tomatoes off. Yeah, this yeah. thing is huge. He's like, I cannot believe this thing is the biggest one. And he thought, no way. So you just never know. Just play with never stuff. Know. Put it there. What did I have to lose by sticking the tomatoes in the front? Nothing. Exactly. Does it matter? Does it break some rule that vegetables aren't supposed to be with flowers? No, you can just exactly. do whatever you want. I can make the whole thing vegetables in the front if I want. There's no rules. Right. But we have yeah. these ideas of things the way they should be. Yes. And where did we get those ideas? And who said so? Right. Our environment put labelism and stigmatisms and, and the way, you know, people, people come from different environments and, you know, they stay within their own environment and they say, well, this is how it should be because this is how they grew up, you know, not realizing that just because one person does it one way does not mean that's going to work for another person. Everybody has their own way of doing things. We don't know what's going to work and what's not going to work. We're, you know, it depends where you are in the world. It depends, you know, what you're doing, what you're trying to sell. You know, there's so many factors to put into place. You can't be judgmental and, and judge something when you don't know all the facts, yeah. you know? You know, because everything is different. Just where you live alone can make a huge difference on how well a product will sell. You know, just oh, by absolutely. so many small factors that can be huge factors, you know. So it's really, you know, people, you know, can't make really judgments until they understand the whole thing. Yeah, the, it's like the sweepstakes hobby. So I tell people first, they have to make the hobby their own because what works for me might not work for them. Right. But there's certain fundamental rules like, Always set up an email address just for entering sweepstakes. Use a sweepstakes site to find legitimate sweepstakes because they make it easy for you because they're all aggregated into one spot. Always right. read the rules. Like those kind of things are important. But I live in Canada. And my American counterparts down in the States, they pay taxes on winnings over $600. I don't pay taxes on any winnings. But I always say I would happily give Uncle Sam my cut if I could win like my American friends. So when I was at the sweepstakes convention and um, Tom Cavalli, they were introducing the expert panel. So it was myself and Tom Cavalli who owns I Win Contests and um, Christy um, Rochester who owns Sweep Sheet and um, Rachel McTavis who owns Sweeping America. So we we're introducing ourselves and how long we've been sweeping. So I've been sweeping since 2000 and I've been sweeping I think the longest out of everybody since 2001 I've won close to $400,000 in prizes including 24 trips Tom wow. started after reading my first book you can't win if you don't enter in 2008 he's passed a million dollars in prizes and he's at 90 he just won his 92nd trip because in wow. the United States the opportunities to win are so much bigger because we only have 36 million people in our country that's less than the state of California so, of course, companies, now you think of it from a business perspective, companies, when they've got their marketing budgets, of course, they're going to be, you've got 36 million people or 360 million people. Right. Where's your budget going to be? Mm -hmm. Right. Your marketing budget is going to be like 10 times the size. So yes. the opportunities and also he also lives in Florida. So he has opportunities, more opportunities for Disney World, for Universal Studios, for cruises, because yes. they're all local to him. Like he can drive to Miami to get on a boat. He can drive to Cape Canaveral to get on a boat. Right. Right. Like he's he goes to Disney all the time. Like I think he's won season passes before, things like yeah. that. So he's in a different. Now, I've got one of my sweepstakes friends. We have, I do virtual contest club meetings because 
they they're actually clubs that were in person like if you watch the movie the prize winner of defiance ohio or read the book yeah they had sweepstakes clubs back in the day and helene actually talks about in this book sweepstakes clubs that she belonged to um but of course with covid that stopped so i missed all my sweepy friends so i started holding club meetings online mm -hmm. and one of our members he lives in rural idaho well his opportunities to win things there's going to be less than tom because he's not near a major city so yeah. he can't win like uh, like i live near toronto so there's always movie premieres and theater and concerts and stuff so i win i, mean, I think one year George and I, every couple of weeks, we're literally going to something like a movie premiere, concert tickets, theater tickets. Like it was ridiculous. It was a lot of fun, actually. Free dates. Yeah. With that. Um, and I also don't say free. I say cheap because I should say cheap because you still have to pay for your parking. And then, of course, you get a drink when you're at the concert and you might have right. dinner out first. I mean, you're still paying for all that. But then the yeah. concert tickets themselves were were free. Right. Um, so I remind people that nothing is a hundred percent free in that right. sense. But yes. um, oh my gosh, where was I going with this? <laughs> this is my brain. I have three businesses, so I'm doing this all day long. Okay, I'm talking on this one. I'm talking on that one. I got to send an email from this one. I got to post for that one. Um, so you know. It, when you're in somewhere rural, well, you're not going to those concerts. You're not going to the, you know, the local radio station might have something. Yes. It's not the same. So your opportunities are less. And now you're just entering statewide and nationals versus really local, like, you know, right. Chicago, New York, LA. You know, I have friends that live near Disneyland and Hollywood and stuff. And she's always winning like the big LA premiere tickets or wow. things like that. I'm like, Ooh, I wish I lived close. I'd be your plus one. Wow. Right. So, so it depends. And that's like you're saying with the business, right? So yeah. depending on where you're living here now, it's easier digitally because basically we do have the whole world open to us, but we, there's all these other forces that we don't have any control over. And we have to take that into account when we're doing this. Wow. Is there any trick to, to winning? Cause you, you've done a really Lots. good job. They have to be prepared to lose. Now, this is the thing. People go, you're so lucky. You're winning stuff all the time. But they don't see me entering for an hour a day. I enter probably 150 giveaways and I might win one. Like you win. Right. Like when I'm entering now, I have not been entering steadily for the last couple of months because I've been publishing books and traveling. So that just slices off the entry time. But um, I, when I'm entering consistently, I usually win somewhere between five and 15 prizes a month. And I count everything. Like if I play an online instant win game and I win a soda bottle, like a yeah. bottle of pop, that is a prize at a dollar 59. I won that right mm -hmm. up to what was the biggest prize I won? Oh, I did a video recently and I showed the hundred inch TV that was so big. We couldn't even fit it in the house. It went into the garage. George was very happy. It takes a whole <laughs> wall. He has this big garage and we put up this hundred inch TV and now it's the man cave. Everybody comes over and watches the hockey game or the uh, baseball game or football, like whatever's happening at the moment. No, yeah. I'll hang out there because it's huge. Um, you know, so I, you know, things like that are trips. I love the trips. Like one year I took my sister and my brother-in-law and George and I, we all went to Mexico for a week. Totally paid for. Wow right? Like, so, you know, I count everything in between. And so I win, but people don't notice that if you're entering, let's see, my math is terrible. That's thankfully there's, um, there's calculators because of my math. So if I do 150 a day times 30 days, that's 4,500 entries a month. Right. And if I win 55, how many did I lose? 3,900, 4,000, Right. 495 I lost yeah but nobody looks at that right they only look at I think Babe Ruth had that stat didn't he 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 batted what 350 or something but that means he's missing the other 650 right but nobody looks at that everyone goes oh my god he was the greatest hitter of all time yeah they only look at what he what he won not what he lost 
And so it's the same right. thing, but I don't focus on the ones that I lost. I look at the whole hobby. Like I have a little Chromebook and I, I got a little TV stand, a special computer, tele, like a uh, breakfast table kind of thing. Yeah. Lap, lap table, but with legs. So I'll sit on my, on my spot on the couch and I have it and we'll be watching a movie and I'm entering away and I'm just happy because we're just hanging out and I might have my cup of tea. And we're watching a good show and I'm entering and I'm dreaming. Ooh, ooh, look at this one. We can go here. Oh, I just found one for a car. Put my entry in. You know, like that's part of the hobby. Part of the hobby is the dreaming and the, I don't always win them, but it's yeah. the whole process. Just enjoying your time and right. relaxing and and then when the winds come, you know, I learn, I answer every call, even if it says could be spam, because you never know. Right. <laughs> People go, I don't answer those. I'm like, but if, what if it's a win? What if it's yeah. a win and it's accidentally marked wrong? <laughs> you can always block it after if it's wrong, if it's spam. <laughs> so true. So true. Now, if you had to take everything we talked about today and you had to summarize, summarize it, what are some important things you'd like to emphasize about today's conversation? I think I think people need to not take life as seriously as we do. Like it is a game, play, have fun, reclaim. I've always said this for maybe the last 30 years. There was that famous Robert Frost poem. And mm -hmm. I, think, I think the last line is, it's it's always gold like you want to look at the world yeah like with fresh eyes and that everything's golden and you know appreciate everything I've I think it's also part you probably have noticed this as you get older you appreciate the little things like oh it's a really nice cup of coffee and oh my bedroom slippers are so fuzzy and look at the flowers in my garden and oh look at the sunset tonight and oh I love a warm breeze and all those things that just usually whiz past us when we're younger and we are trying to get to the future. And now that we're in the future, we're like, okay, we're going to slow down a bit and appreciate the now and look where we yeah. are and have that. I think that's what we need to do is just be present, enjoy the moment. Don't stress about the things that, you know, could be going wrong. Turn remember they're projects, not problems. Right. Right. And, and it will, um, I can't remember who said this, but it's all figure outable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, I'd love to give credit to that person because it is, it's all figure outable. <laughs> I like that. I and like it'll that. be okay. It'll be okay. It'll definitely be okay. I agree. Now, where can people find you? Well, uh, words for winning if you want to read any of my books and read any of the um, blogs and hear the audios from Helene and an example. And if you want to learn how to win sweepstakes, that's contestqueen.com. <laughs> Those are my two uh, most favorite places. And if you're, you want to, uh, if you have a sweepstakes that you want to market, you can always find me at idea majesty, but really everybody wants to learn how to win. So contest queen is very popular. <laughs> <laughs> So are there any other services that you provide? Besides no, I just, I just, I teach people how to win. I help people viral market their giveaways and I write books teaching people how to win in life. I love it. I love yeah. it. Oh, wow. This has been great, Carolyn. Carolyn, I, I'm so glad you came on the show. You've been such an inspiration and, you know, you took ideas and things that meant something to you and you made them happen. And, you know, and it, it, it takes a lot of, you know, resilience, you know, for, for a woman to, you know, take a dream and make it a reality because there's lots of obstacles that you have to overcome. And you obviously, you know, you rose above the chaos. You, you know, you overcame your obstacles and you made all your, your, dreams become a reality so I have to commend you on that because you've done a wonderful job with all three businesses and your stories are very inspiring very amusing and you know I'm so glad you came on the show to you know show people that you know anyone could do it if they really put their mind to it if yes. they put their mind to it and they create a productive plan and they stay consistent anything's possible it's true and you are also proof of that <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, Thank you. Know what? you.
Today has been a great day. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And I hope you'll be on the show again. And I really enjoyed everything that you shared with us in the audience today. Thank you so much. Thanks again.